الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا قيام يوم الدين ولعنة الله على أعدائه مجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله جرنا وجركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We continue with our topic and yesterday we stated that we want to work into this theme with the aid of the Quran so at least we have this sense that whatever we are saying is rooted within the scripture itself these are not mere thoughts of thinking people but they do have some affirmative backing from within the core of what we call the communication from the divine which is undisputable now people normally frown when we talk about the salvation of others when we talk about the equal standing of others who are different from us people frown on that and we feel that is this justified as we said yesterday of course we come to a point where we want to justify ourselves in our own standing our own position and in order to justify it for ourselves we put down the other and we say that whatever we have is better than everybody else otherwise why would I be the way I am had it not been the best way but when we begin to think critically we say well hold on beyond my distinctions beyond my identity there is a greater truth where we all share universally and that is where we actually belong in essence so when people frown they come out with these sort of things well why should I fast for 20 hours and somebody else gets into paradise without fasting at all if you think about this carefully it's a very unholy and an ungodly attitude the blessed prophet of Allah as we hear from our auditors he said that Allah asks me not to stand at the graves of the hypocrites and Allah said even if you pray for them and do istighfar for them 70 times I will not forgive them the blessed prophet said if only Allah had told me O Muhammad if you stand there 70 times and seek forgiveness I will forgive them I would have stood at every single grave and sought forgiveness for them that was the godly attitude of Prophet Muhammad when he was dying he said to the angel of death but the pain is unbearable is the pain thank you is the pain angel said this is the minimum pain any dying person will incur the prophet said in that case oh angel give me the sum total of the pains of my ummah till the day of qiyamah so none of my followers have to grow through this and endure this that's the godliness that we should possess a parent will say to Allah, Oh Allah, give me the sins of my children, but bring no pain to them. When a Muslim says, Why do I fast for 20 hours and somebody else gets into paradise without fasting? That shows that the Muslim has moved away from the truest Islam. Instead of godliness, something else is prevailing upon their minds and hearts. Surely a godly person will say, Oh Allah, let me fast in excess of 20 hours so that you will put all of them into paradise. That should be the godly attitude, shouldn't it? Why should we have this attitude that, Oh Allah, don't put them into paradise because they haven't fasted? On the other hand, if we are at university, it's like somebody 
in Oxford saying that why should anybody in Cambridge pass? Why should they get the job that I will get? I'm in a more prestigious university. It just shows that the attitude has become ungodly. No problem. Salawat. So when we see these attitudes, we begin to understand that actually Islam has become a formalistic Islam. And the essence of Islam, which is to become godly and godlike, has left the souls of the Muslims altogether. Because had these Muslims been surrendered to their Rahman and Rahim God, they would be as forgiving as God is. Do you know what our God is like? He gives paradise on excuses. He just wants an excuse to give his paradise away. He is like a benevolent father. The father says, just give me an opportunity to give you everything I have. He is like that. Look at the Blessed Prophet's hadith. This is, by the way, just a prelude as we get into this talk for today. The Blessed Prophet said, if you switch on or if you light a candle inside the mosque, God will enlighten your grave. If you were to pick up a piece of trash from the mosque, God will expand your grave. If you were to smile at one another, God will give you paradise. This is how cheap paradise is. But we are not after paradise, are we? It is like Qais saying to Layla, Layla, give me this house when Layla is the empress of the whole kingdom. <coughs> it's like Thais, her blind lover, saying to Layla, Layla, give me your throne, give me your kingdom. Case would be a fool. Case should say to Layla, Layla, I live for you, I die for you. What cause do I have with your kingdom? I am after you. I want your love and your attention. It is like a mother saying to the child, oh child, I don't want any riches of this world. I'm at the end of my life. All I want is you. So we are not after paradise. We are after the one from whose single ray the paradise has been created. We are after him. So now, <coughs> we're going to our talk. What does the Quran say about all of this? When we look at the general verses of the Quran regarding mankind, Allah says, I taught Adam the names. <coughs> Salawat. So when Allah taught Adam all the names, we ask a question. If Adam's role was just to come here and worship Allah, then why was Adam taught all those names? Why did the angels feel a sense of fear from Adam? The knowledge base of Adam was so tremendous that the angels were in awe of Adam. If our simplistic, naive understanding of religion is true, that we sit on the musalla and pray, or we take a tasbih and remember God, or we fast for 20 hours, then what are all the names doing in the mind of Adam? Surely the angels worshipped Allah longer than Adam could, without any fatigue. Their prostrations are unending. Their tasbis do not cease. Why was Adam taught all the names? And then if we look at Adam in the Quran, Adam is not an individual. Adam is mankind in its entirety. Allah says, Indeed, we created you, and then we fashioned you, and then we said to the angels, <coughs> prostrate before Adam. So our creation is prior to the prostration before Adam. Adam is that one person that represents the entirety of humanity from the time of Adam till the day of Qiyamah. So those names that were taught to Adam were taught to every one of us. What is this knowledge base inside us? What is it doing there? Surely it plays into the purpose that God has for us on the face of this earth. 
Surely that is why Allah takes pride in Adam over the angels. It wasn't due to the worship of Adam. It was due to this colossal knowledge base in the head of Adam. When Iblis used to give sermons and his tasbi used to drop, the angels used to rush. <laughs> I don't have a tasbi in my hand, yes? But the angel did rush here, so. Salawat, <laughs> please. So then, what is the purpose of mankind with all this knowledge that mankind has? Allah says again in the Quran, "Ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal-insa illa liyabudun." I have not created jinn or man, save that they should be devoted to me. Now look at the simplistic mind of the Muslim. Muslim feels that Allah has created jinn and man so that they should sit on the musalla and do worship. Worship for them means these daily prayers. But ya'budun ibada in Arabic means to serve. Serving God is not worship. Worship is a part of it. But serving God is what? We look at another verse. خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةُ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا He has created death and life so that he may test you that which one of you are best in deeds. And we feel best in deed means what? Worship. Best in deed means no. It means how far you will use this knowledge that Allah has given you. Because he calls the best deeds in the way that we understand best deeds as amalun salih. And ahsan amal is how we use our knowledge base to exploit nature. How we work through nature. Allah takes utmost pride and says to the angel, look at this one. He has no abilities that any of the animal kingdom has. Yet without wings he will fly. Not only shall he conquer air, but he shall conquer the galaxies that are above him. He will not rest until he puts his stamp of authority on the entirety of the universe. This is what I have created. And Allah takes utmost pride in this Adam. Would you take pride in somebody for fasting 20 hours? Or would you take pride in somebody who creates a spacecraft that takes human beings who are not even microscopic from Earth and lands them onto Mars? What would you take pride in? On somebody's tasmi or somebody's achievement? You create an insignificant creature and he grab, grabs the whole of the galaxy in the palm of his hand. Now that is what you call pride. So when Allah says, I have not created man and jinn save to worship, it's directly in line with that knowledge base that Allah has given. This worship means devotion. Devote yourself to me and become like me. It means at two levels. The first level is See the nature that I've given you. Conquer space. Conquer nature. And come of age and become a nurturer like me. Nurture the earth. Become a creator like me. Become a curer like me. Dispel poverty. Cure sicknesses. Become like me. That's the first thing. And the other thing is, become totally focused to me. So there are two things Allah is asking for in service to God. One is God's centricity, psychological alignment to God. And the other one is to use this great knowledge base to become God-like. Now we go further. So these are the purposes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for humankind. On the other hand, Allah says, La ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion in religion. Now we will... Not translate deen as religion right now, but just save it in your minds. I need just to save these verses in our minds because we're going to be coming back to them again and again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, beautifully, for whole of mankind, If Allah wanted, He would have made mankind one people. However, they will always be indifferent about things with each other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is admitting to variety and plurality. And Allah deliberately does not want to make us into one people. How dare the Muslim want to, con to, to convert the whole of humanity into Islam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deliberately wants to keep us separate and different? Isn't that interesting? 
how little we read the word of the Quran, we will come to it in later lectures. That the differences that we have, this individuality that we, that we have, is the hallmark of our existence and our creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and from his signs are the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the differences of your languages and your colors, in that are signs for those who know and understand. Think about this thing very carefully. As I said, we'll revert to this afterwards. Can any two people be same at any level in this world of God? No two people can ever be the same. In features, we are not the same. Even identical twins are not identical in every way. Now you might say, we are in the same room. But I will ask you a question. Are we in the same room? Or is the room different from the way we are perceiving it? Are two of us seeing the same thing in the same way, given the difference of the strength of our perceptions and sense, uh, sense perception? And then beyond that, are we interacting with whatever we are perceiving at the sense level in the same way? It's like two people watching the same movie. One bursts out crying, and the other one is laughing, like my daughters and me when we watch Nemo. And they said, it's so embarrassing, we will never come back with you again. I was laughing, they were crying, by the way. <laughs> so these differences are made by God, and God condones these differences. Now, look at how beautifully God talks about the truth despite the differences. He says, O oh people, I have created you from a male and from a female, and I have made you, we have made you into nations and into tribes. So that by mutual interaction, you may begin to learn that the best among you is the one most God conscious of you. How phenomenal is this verse? He is not addressing the Muslims, he is not addressing the believers, and he is not addressing the people of the book. He is addressing mankind as a whole. He said, I have made you into different groupings. But the whole purpose is that you interact with each other and begin to learn that despite your differences, there is commonality. And that commonality is which one of you comes to the fullest realization of their existence and comes to the pinnacle of godliness. So that you may bear witness that you might be black, you might be brown, you might be yellow. These differences are arbitrary, accidental. The best among you is not in their brownness or whiteness or yellowness, but is in their humanity and godliness. You might be a Christian, you might be a Hindu, you might be a Muslim, you might be a Buddhist. The best among you is not with the label of faith. The best among you is the one in whose soul there is the truth of God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these broad verses is making this very, very clear that you are different, yet your origin is the same. Your purpose is to intellectually come of age. Your purpose is to be God-centric. You are all different of necessity, but in essence, you are one and the same. And your goal is to become god like. When we look at these verses, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deliberately has kept things the way in which he has. So we see from here that plurality is an absolute norm, a hallmark of existence, and we can't read it. Our features are different, our languages are different, our cultures are different, our religions are different, our ways of life are different, and people within one religion will understand religion differently. Before we progress on to the next point, I want to make this point. The Shias often say that ideal situation was for everybody to be Shia and believe Imam Ali Salamullah is the first Khalifa and is the first Imam. And I say, then what would have happened? They said, well, we would have had a uniform Islam. I said, okay, fine. Then why did the Zaydis became Zaydis despite believing Imam Ali is the first Imam. 
And if that's the case, then why did the Ismaili become Ismaili and Ishnashri become Ishnashri, given that they both believe in Imam Ali as the first Imam? Do you not see this? Differences are inherent within us. The way in which we interpret things, the way in which we learn things, even if everybody were to have accepted Imam Ali as the first Imam and as the first Khalifa, they would have divided on Hassan and Hussein salamu alayhim, or Imam Zulun al or Imam Bakir, or Imam Jabr al-Sadiq, wherever. But they would have always been divided. That's what Allah is saying. Wala yazaluna mukhtalifin. They will never cease to be different. Being different is the hallmark of existence. But being different in non-essential features. You might find this strange that believing in different prophet is non-essential. It's absolutely non-essential and we will go into it as the talks progress. Now what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk, say about the monotheistic faiths? If you look at the Quran, the prophet comes into Medina. For the first time he is faced with organized faiths from the believers of the uh, Abrahamic faiths or the believers of Ibrahim. The verse of the Quran in Surah Baqarah, the very second verse says, Muttaqeen are those people who believe in everything revealed unto you, O Muhammad, and revealed before you. What does that say? That all these revelations are one and the same. There is no difference amongst them at all. We are claiming that they are all from the same God, and therefore, in essence, the speech of God has to be the same. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرَعْتًا وَمِنْ هَاجًا I have given all of you your own sharias. So I've given you your specific sharias, he says to the different groups. We will come back to this verse more thoroughly afterwards. And your minhaj and your paths. What is our sharia, the Muslim sharia? The do's and don'ts, the spiritual practices and the contract law, our sharia. So we have given all of you your sharias, he's saying to the people of the Abrahamic faiths. But I think he's going beyond Abrahamic faiths. Because the whole of mankind is governed by the same God. And if Allah wanted, he would have made you into one people. So he's saying, I've given you all your individual sharias. Had I wanted, I could have made you into one people. Yet I have not made you into one people. I have made you into different people and I've given you your own different sharias. Why? In order for him to test you in what he has given you. So he has given you all different sharias. In order to test you how you've done with your sharia, how you've done with your sharia, how you've done with your sharia. And look at the verse as it ends. Fastabiqul khayrat. So therefore compete against each other in doing good. So he's saying to the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims immediately. I've given you your different sharias. I've deliberately not made you into one people. Had I wanted to, I would have made you into one people. Now my aim from you is to see from what I have given you, which one of you does the best from the other. So he's not preferring the Muslim over a Jew, or a Jew over a Christian, or a Christian over a Muslim. I've given you all your different sharias. I have deliberately not made you into one people. The only reason for that is that I want to see, in accordance with whatever I have given you, how far you can go in goodness. There is no bias for the Muslim here. All are equal. Ilallah marja'ukum jami'a. All of your eventual return is to Allah without fail. So we are seeing from here very clearly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a singular essence who becomes most godly. And he's talking about different forms, your different sharias, your different manahij. But the central point is. Go forward with whatever I have given you and attain the best of yourself. In other places, Allah SWT makes certain distinctions. Do not dispute with the people of the book. Say with that which is the best thing. If you and they were equal, Allah is saying, then there would be no reason to dispute. But He is saying, look, you are different. 
And quite rightly, one is wrong in the way that they are understanding. So here, when you discuss with them, discuss with them in the best possible way, that verse in itself implies that when you dispute, when you discuss, one's point of view is not as accurate as the other one's point of view. So Allah is acknowledging this, that when people say that God has a son, that they are mistaken in that assumption of theirs. You can rationally discuss this. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُولُوا آمَنَّا بِالَّذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَأُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ وَإِلَاهُنَا وَإِلَاهُكُمْ وَاحِدٌ And tell them that we believe in everything that has been revealed unto us, everything that has been revealed unto you. Our God and your God are one God. So they're saying in essence and in principle, we are the same people. Your God and our God is one God. We believe in whatever has been revealed unto you and whatever has been revealed unto us. So it's one revelation. However, we feel that you have interpreted your revelation in a manner that might not be accurate. But that inaccuracy of interpretation of their uh, revelation does not bring about condemnation at all. It does not bring about condemnation. Because in essence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them salvation. As we saw in the previous verses, he is going beyond the people of the book. But he does acknowledge that there might be certain misinterpretation of the nature of God. And in that, it is allowed for us to rationally discuss that one person may be on the truth in understanding and the other person may not be on the truth. That is at the rational level of understanding the nature of God, whether he is one, he has avatars, he has children or not. But at another level, we are all the same. It is the same God that we have. It is the same revelation that we have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again disputes with the Christians. They come to the Prophet and they make a case for Nabi Isa being the son of God. And their main claim is that Nabi Isa was not born through the agency of a father, was not conceived through the agency of a father. Allah responds. He said, and it's such a simple, logical, rational response. He says, the example of Isa with Allah is like the example of Adam. He made Adam from dust and said to him, be, and he was. Now it's very simple logic. He's saying if your claim is that Isa does not have a father, then Adam does not have a father or a mother. So you have to admit that Adam by priority is the greater son of God. And if you do not admit that Adam is the greater son of God, then by priority admit that Isa is not his son. It's very simple logic. Then Allah says, now if at a rational level you are not going to concede then let's engage in mutual imprecation and curse the false ones. You all know what happened at that point, and they did not engage in this mutual imprecation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored them. He said, in that case, go away. Be Christians. Even though they could not respond at a rational level, but yet their commitment to Isa was so firm inside their souls, and even then, they were not convinced about their devotion to Isa that they could engage with the Prophet and his family in invoking the curse of God upon the wrongful ones. Even then, their attachment to Isa and Allah through Isa was so firm that Allah acknowledged it. He said, even though at a rational level, you are defeated, and at an emotional level, you do not have sufficient confidence in yourself, Yet this thing that is inside you, that you are upholding the truth, and you do not feel sophisticated enough to defend it, Allah will honor that. And He let them be. He does not curse them beyond that. In fact, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَسْتُمْ عَلَى شَيْءِ حَتَّى تُقِيمُ التَّوْرَاةَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ وَمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ He says, O people of the book, you are upon nothing until you establish the Torah and the Injil. 
if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not value them, if he felt there was no truth in them, he would not say to them that there is no worth in you until you establish the Torah and the Injil. It just shows that when Allah says he's given them their own Sharia and their own path, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is condoning it as well. Allah is directly telling them, you are upon no solid grounds until you establish the Torah and the Injil and whatever has been revealed unto you. And once you do that, you are firm believers in whatever Allah has given you, despite the intellectual perversion that they might have, despite the wrong notion of God that they might have. And how beautifully Allah speaks in the Quran. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَنْ لَا نَعْبُدَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ Say to the people of the book, come to that which is common between us and between you, that we shall not worship other than Allah, and we shall not associate anything with Allah. Now, if we look at these verses, we see beautifully that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is admitting to plurality within the monotheistic faith. At times, he is talking of Islam in an inclusivist sense, although we want to go much beyond that. Inclusivism means what? That other faiths also consist of aspects of truth. He is condoning that, that they also have truth inside them. He is talking about tolerance, as with the verse of Mubahila. You are clearly wrong, but we will work together. He's talking about interfaith dialogue and mutual cooperation in the sense of pluralism. Come to us and come with us in that thing which is common between us. So he's talking about all these types of pluralisms. Religious pluralism in the sense of inclusivism. He's talking about pluralism in the sense of interfaith dialogue. He's talking about pluralism in the sense of let's cooperate together and work together. But then look at this beautiful verse in which Allah is saying, Indeed, those who bring faith, those who are Jews, the Christians, the Sabians. So he's named these four categories in Medina because maybe these four categories were immediately available in the context of Medina. And that is why other categories are not mentioned without distinguishing between any of them, he is giving the faith categorizations. Those who believe, at that point the one who believed meant one who is following the instructions as given by Muhammad Rasulullah. They did not have a formal name by that time of Muslim or Islam in the capital I. So those who believe meant whoever is following Muhammad Rasulullah and whatever is coming through Prophet Muhammad as revealed by Allah. The Jews, the Christians, and the Sabians. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts them all on the same pedestal. And then he gives this conditional statement. Amongst these four, whoever believes in Allah, the last day, and does righteous deeds. So he is not giving preference to those who believe over the Jews, or the Jews over the Christians, or the Christians over the Sabians. And he's not giving any preference of the Sabians over the ones who believe. He's saying with all your labels, with all these formalistic labels and the faiths that you belong to, which are organized faiths. So he is not giving any salvation to any individual in any organized faith. He's putting all the organized faiths together. And he says the people of all these organized faiths in those organized faiths, whichever individual believes in Allah beyond the organized faith, the day of judgment, and does righteous deed, they will have their reward and no fear shall befall them, nor shall they grieve. How phenomenal is this verse? He's lining up all the faiths and says, now, beneath those labels, whoever truly believes in God, not just the profession that I'm a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Sabian, whoever truly believes in God from within, the hereafter, and does righteous deeds, then they will have their reward. 
This is known as pluralism in its entirety. Giving salvation to people of every faith. Provided essentially they are centered with God. And they do righteous deeds. So when we look at the Quran, we are seeing a whole host of pluralistic ideas coming out. Inclusivism. We are seeing religious tolerance. We are seeing religious dialogue. And we are seeing perennialism, that every one of them in essence can belong to the truth. Just as that universal verse, in Akramakum andallah atqaqum, in line with that verse came this verse. That whoever believes in Allah and the last name does righteous deeds, they will have their reward in their Jannah and their paradise. There is no paradise to be gained by the label Islam or Judaism or Christianity. Paradise is to be gained through that internal truth intuitively when itself realizes itself. Now when we cite this verse, people find it very, very difficult. So they say, well, what about all the verses in the Quran that condemn people of other faiths? Let's take the most obvious verse and analyze it. In Surah Tawbah, قَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَلَا يُحَرِّمُونَ مَحَرَّمَ اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولُ وَلَا يُدِينُونَ دِينَ الْحَقِّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ Fight the people who do not believe in Allah, nor the last day, nor prohibit what the Prophet, what Allah and His Prophet have prohibited, nor do they abide by the righteous deen amongst the people who have been given the book. Now somebody can bring this verse and say, see, this is exclusivism. Islam is saying it's the only one that is truth. The others are false. Otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not command His Messenger to fight against them. I will say, let's contrast these two verses carefully. We said in the first verse, the verse says, those who believe, the Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, among them, whoever believes, so those who believe is not of any consequence. Amongst them, whoever believes, so falling within a faith means nothing. It is faith within a faith that is something. Is that coming through? Just to say I'm a Muslim by birth does not mean anything to God. But to personally and individually acknowledge God from the depth of the soul and then do righteous work is something of merit. But otherwise being a Muslim has no merit. But that merit is available for the Jew and the Christian and the Sabian as well. So Muslim does not have any priority according to this verse. According to this verse. So Allah is saying you can be a Muslim, but beyond the label you have to be a greater Muslim. You can be a Christian, but beyond the label you have to be in a greater state of surrender. You can be a Jew or Sabian. If you look at that other verse, what does it say? Among the people of the book, Whoever does not believe in Allah, and this verse is saying among the people of the book, whoever believes in Allah. Are you seeing the distinction? In the first verse, whoever the people of the book believes in Allah, they will have their reward. The second verse is saying, whoever amongst the people of the book does not believe in Allah, fight them. Are you seeing the distinction here? People of the book means next, not, next to nothing to God. From the people of the book, here we will include the Muslims as well, yes? The Muslim, Jews, Christians, Sabians. Amongst these Abrahamic faiths, whoever believes in Allah will have reward. Amongst the Abrahamic faiths of Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Sabianism, whatever, Zoroastrianism, whatever you have, whoever does not believe in Allah will be condemned. Are you seeing this distinction? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a distinction at the very core of it in terms of who belongs to God and who opposes God. He is not making any distinction in terms of the label of Islam or the namaz or the fast or the Lent or Easter or Christmas. He can't be bothered with all those things. We have given you all your Sharia and your Minhaj. You faced east, you faced west, whatever you want to face at. You go around this house, you go around that house. You wail at that wall, you wail at that wall. Whatever you want to do. You do Ruku and Sujood, they only do Sujood. 
You pray once a you you fast once a month, you you fast 30 days. All of these are of no consequence to him. Of course, they are all very important as we will explain afterwards. I've always been told to clarify myself. <laughs> a Muslim has to fast, has to pray, has to do hajj. Has, a Muslim has to do those things. Now we'll explain that further afterwards. But within an outer shell, which is the form, is an essence. Allah is giving salvation in accordance with the essence. And the form is next to nothing. Your form may be whatever it is, but if in the essence there is God and godliness, then you have salvation. Your form might be the best form of Islam, but if in the essence there is no godliness, then you're an enemy of God. The distinction is made in terms of godliness and ungodliness. That's where the distinction is made. Note that these verses justify exclusivism. Now, look at the design of God. We all think this naively, don't we? That towards the end of life, everybody's going to become a Muslim. Yes? And Islam shall prevail. It's a very misinterpreted verse. He has sent his messenger with guidance and the righteous religion so that it may prevail over all religion. So we naively interpret that to mean that everybody's going to become a Muslim, right? And there's going to be singularity. And there's going to be uniformity. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. With qala Allah, ya Isa. And when Allah said, O Isa, inni mutawafika, I shall complete your journey. Wa rafi'uka ilayya, and I will raise you to me. Wa mutahiruka, and I will purify you, min alladhina kafaru, from the people who disbelieve. Wa ja'ilu alladhina taba'uka, fawq alladhina kafaru, ila yawm al qiyamah. I will make the people who follow you, Above the people who disbelieve till the day of Qiyamah. He is giving Christianity, longevity, and extension of life till the day of Qiyamah. Muslim feels that everybody is going to convert into Islam. And Allah is saying he's going to perpetuate Christianity till the day of Qiyamah. And he is going to have the disbelievers till the day of Qiyamah. The people who do not believe. If you don't admit that Christianity is going to continue to the day of Qiyamah, then at least you have to admit by this verse that disbelief and kufr is going to continue to the day of Qiyamah. Because Allah is saying it. I will make those who follow you, O Isa, above those who are disbelievers till the day of Qiyamah. Imagine. So God's design has got this plurality running till the day of Qiyamah. And how naively the Muslim thinks that everybody is going to convert into Islam. And another verse. وَإِن مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ يُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ There is no one from the people of the book but that they will believe in Isa before their deaths. Or before Isa's death. When Isa, whenever he dies and comes back. <coughs> so if we look at this, the Quran is talking about this variety existing till the day of Qiyamah. The Quran is saying Allah has deliberately not made us into one people. The Quran is saying that he has all, he has given us all different ways and paths. The Quran is saying the singular task is for him to see how well we do. The Quran is saying I've given you different sharias to see which one of you will end up to do the best deeds. The Quran is saying I've invested you with knowledge. And I want to see which one of you does the best of works, not righteous deeds, best of works, how far you will go with this knowledge base. The Quran is saying that as far as the internal being is concerned, salvation is across the board beyond the label. The Quran is saying the label does not mean anything. If there is corruption inside there, you are damned. So the story that the Quran is opening up is a very different story to the naive assumptions that we have. Now I want to finish off with exclusivism. Exclusivism means that we are the only truthful ones, everybody else is untrue, either in the way they understand things or either in terms of salvation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates these verses in Surah Baqarah, all from the Jews and the Christians. وَقَالُوا كُونُوا هُودًا أَوْ نَسَارَ تَحْتَدُوا and they say, become Jews or Christians and you will be guided aright. 
Allah responds, Kul bal millata Ibrahima Hanifa. Rather, we follow the religion of Ibrahim, the upright monotheist. And he was not a polytheist. So the, the Muslims are rebuttaling the Christians and the Jews and are saying, no, we follow Abraham, the monotheist, and that is the right course. Not in all your ceremonies of Judaism or Christianity. Because the Muslims did not have all those ceremonies when they came into Medina because that faith wasn't established yet. The direction of prayer wasn't fixed. The fasting laws weren't fixed. The Hajj laws weren't fixed. The Muslims were just in an embryonic stage, trying to come up. So they're saying, be Jew Yehudi or Nasara and you'll be guided aright. Allah is saying, no, we follow the religion of Abraham, who was a monotheist, wasn't a polytheist, and that in essence is righteousness, beyond all your practices. Then again, Allah quotes them, وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَسَارًا They say, nobody will enter paradise except for the one who is a Jew or a Christian. Allah rebuttals, تِلْكَ أَمَانِيُّهُمْ This is their wishful thinking. Bring your evidences, he says. This is your wishful thinking. Then Allah says, بَلَا مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهُهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنْ فَلَهُ أَجْرُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ Yes. He who surrenders himself to Allah and does good work, then they will have their reward. Whether you're a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim or whatever you are. It's a very universal verse. But he is condemning them for this exclusivist remark that only we are on salvation. Finally, I'll quote this verse. وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارِ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا They say, that the fire will not touch us save for a few days because we are the chosen ones. It's a very exclusive claim. Allah says, have you taken a pledge with Allah or are you talking about things you know not of? This is what the Muslims say, right? Allah says in response, yes, he who has done wrong and is totally surrounded by sin, they will abide in the fire forever. As for those who believe and do righteous works, they will abide in paradise forever. Again, a very universal response. So after looking at the Quran very generally, we do see that the Quran is not concerned about this plurality in a negative way. In fact, the Quran condones these differences. And it is through design that Allah has made these differences. And beyond the differences, Allah has given different paths for us to follow. But in essence, we are all the same. And that surge forward, in essence, is towards becoming God-like. And therein is salvation. And if anybody says that we are the right ones and you are the wrong ones, Quran quickly condemns that claim. So this is what we see from the Quran as we go into this theme more thoroughly. If we look at the attitude of the Prophet, the Prophet was phenomenal. Lady Aisha says he was cultured by the Quran. He came into Medina. He created two types of communities. The first was the community of the Muslims. The second one was the community of human beings in Medina. The community of Muslim was a religious community. The broader community was a non-religious community, was a pluralistic community. For the broader community, he allowed for the practice, free practice of their religion. And in that broader community were the Jews, a few Christians and pagans. He said, we are one people. On the basis of our human commonality and our proper gains, and our equal enemies, or common enemies. Everybody has their equal rights, and everybody is an equal citizen of Medina here. And as far as his religious community was concerned, whenever they were attacked as Muslims, there was no obligation upon the broader and the bigger community to assist the Muslims in their wars. So immediately he creates this broader community in accordance with his understanding of the Quran without any bias towards the Muslim or against the broader and the wider community. This was his mindset. 
This is why we see that these prophetic people always appeal to mankind at large because of this beautiful universality that they have in themselves. Hussein ibn Ali was obviously the grandson of this beloved prophet and he too had that prophetic substance and his attitude was such. That is why when we look at Hussein ibn Ali, we find it very difficult to narrow him down to Islam. We always see him as that universal figure. He is in Medina. He is in Mecca. Several people come to him in Mecca. Abdullah bin Umar, the son of Khalifa Umar, comes to him. Imam Hussein says to him, Come with me. I'm going towards Kufa. In the course of the conversation, as Imam Hussein is encouraging him, he says to Abdullah bin Umar, Know full well that if your father Umar was here today, he would have unsheathed his sword and stood behind me, defending me as he defended the Prophet of Islam. Then he met his half-brother, Muhammad Hanafiya, and he said, go back to Medina and inform the people of Medina of what is happening. It was a part of his strategy. But then Ibn Abbas comes to Imam Hussein, <coughs> and he says, oh Hussein, I hear that you have resolved to go to Kufa and that you shall go and consider their invitation. Imam Hussain said, indeed. He said, oh Hussain, they are treacherous people. They will put you to death. Imam Hussain said, Ibn Abbas, these people will not spare me even if I am in Medina or Mecca. They will find me from wherever they find me, and they will put me to death. And I do not wish the sanctity of Medina and Makkah to be violated by the spilling of my blood. Ibn Abbas paused. Zainab stood behind a wall as this conversation took place. So Ibn Abbas said, Hussein, but why do you go to this God-forsaken place? He said, Inna Allah yurid an yarani qatila. Ibn Abbas, Allah wishes to see me slain. He said, O oh Hussein, why do you take your little children? He said, Allah wishes to see them scattered in the plains. He said, why do you take your sisters? And he said, Allah wishes to see them enslaved. And as he said this, Zainab could not tolerate. Least her brother's intention may waver in taking her. She said, Ibn Abbas, you do no justice by saying these things. Do not deter my brother from taking me with him. Ibn Abbas keeps quiet. Hussein proceeds towards Kufa. People come from Kufa. Imam Hussein asks them, about the state of Kufa. Somebody says, a poet, he says, oh Hussein, their tongues are with you, their swords are against you. Hussein continues on his path. Another one comes. He says, do you have any news of Kufa? He said, they have beheaded Muslim and Hani. Their bodies were dropped from, on be, from top of the Darul Imara and dragged within the streets of Kufa. Their heads hang at the palace, at the door of the palace. Hussein hears the news of the death of his brother. He camps there. He calmly asks for the daughters, young daughters of Muslim to be brought to him. When Muslim's young daughters come to Hussein, he lovingly embraces them caresses their heads and gently says, but I too am your father, O child. At that point, the youngest child of Muslim, she looks at Hussein. She says, O oh, uncle, has anything happened to our father? For you do not caress one whose father has not died in this manner. As she asked this, 
there was talk that Muslim children have become orphaned. We hear from the ulama that little Sakina, she wondered, what does it mean to be an orphan? I will say, oh child, when your garments catch fire, when your earrings are snatched, when your face is slapped, and when you call out for your father and there is no response, know at that point you have become an orphan. Ala la'natul ala al-qawmi al-dhalimeen wa sayya'alamu al-ladhina dhalamu wa yamun qalami yanqalibun. Rahmanullah man qara al-fatiha. You know, for Muslims, you know, the sources for the religion is the Quran, which tells us what God said, and Hadith, what the Prophet said, and the Sunnah, what did. Uh, you told us yesterday that there are certain verses from the Quran which we know which are not applicable today, which were applicable possibly during his time, like the sword verses and other verses, and probably were not valid even during his lifetime. So similarly, if what the Prophet did, you know, like uh, imposing jizya on the Christians or Jews, <laughs> and now you're saying those are not valid. Uh, considering we don't have a pope in Islam, who decides which verses or which parts of the Sunnah of the Prophet are no longer va valid as we move along? Absolutely. I'm going to come to this in the later talks, but I'll just gesture it now. The, broad, the teachings of Islam are categorized in broad, two broad categories. The devotions and the interactions, transactions. Devotions are the ones, according to me, that give us our identity. Salah, prayers, fast, hajj. This is what gives a Muslim, Muslim identity. The rest of the interactions, like buying, selling, capital punishment, beating women, marriage at this age, and divorce at like this, and so on, these are all known as interactions. Islam predominantly came to give the identity to a Muslim in terms of the ibadat, spiritual actions. The Mu'amalat were already taking place. The Prophet already came, came in an already existing context. That context was modified to make it into a fairer context. Yes? So the Prophet did not introduce marriage or divorce. He merely looked at those contracts and modified them to make them more fair. He did not come to give rights and to say elaborate on the human rights system to the fullest. He only elaborated it in accordance with his own context and made them more fair and more liberal. <coughs> that is not a component of Islam essentially. That fluctuates with time. We will never get that accurate because as we will explain afterwards, human being is an evolutionary being. With evolutionary beings, you can never have a set model that will fit for all eras or for all locations. It will always fluctuate at all times. So let's give an example. In the Middle East, a woman is provided for. She's a carer. Man is an earner. So her share of inheritance is half of that of a man. It works there. But in this region, if the woman is a provider and a carer, her share being half would be unwarranted and unjust. So her share will be equal, if not more, if she merits that. That part of the Quran is nothing to do with the identity of the Muslim. It's nothing to do with ibadat. It is what is known as transaction and mu'amalat. That will change. Now, it's not necessary that we get it right, because the human community is always fluctuating. The reason why the Muslims are failing is their obsession that we have to get it absolutely accurate. The world of God does not behave on the principles of accuracy. It always behaves on the principles of fallibility. We are always wrong and we are trying to rectify ourselves and hence the evolution. Yes? We always critique and go beyond and critique and go beyond. I've explained in another lecture, it's a dialectic system. Maybe we'll explain that later on. That we are always wrong. We are right in the moment, by tomorrow we are wrong and we have to tweak it up more and more and more. Don't you see? How from feudalism to capitalism to something else? That's how we are always evolving. So that part, muamulat, are nothing to do with Islam. So for today, you will say, beating women, 
Nobody has to decide that this is not something that should be practiced. Everybody knows you can't go and beat women or marrying a two-year-old girl. Everybody knows you can't do it anymore. That was a very different society. Or a woman has to beg a man for a divorce. Yes? Or that you cut people's hands off. Or, I mean, the Prophet, according to me, has never practiced stoning to death, by the way. Never. You know, on that note, I mean, I, I need to be very quick here. You know, we say that the Prophet stoned people to death. You know, I just ask one thing. Ayatollah Muhaddiq wrote an article that this one incident has been reported ten different ways and people feel he has stoned six couples to death. Tell me, he reduces it to one event. But I ask, I ask, the Prophet has taken people to the desert, buried a man and a woman up to their chest, and got a crowd to throw stones at them when it's not in the Quran. And then only a handful of people are reporting this. It's a shocking event. The 50, 100 people who are there should have been shocked to the core. And they should have said, the Prophet did this and we threw the stones and this is how she was screaming and this is how she was bleeding. There should have been an uproar. Do you think something like this can take place and only three people report it? So most of these sort of accounts that we have are questionable, their historicity, that are they even right or wrong. But even if stoning did take place, it would not take place anymore. So it's not a a very sort of a difficult position to say who decides this. The human mature mind will decide this. It doesn't happen anymore. Huh? Maybe in some regions of the world it might be still be valid who are very primitive, but certainly not in this part. Mentioned in terms of plurality that Allah has said I have given <coughs> different sharias and you identified the meaning of sharia as path. Is the meaning of sharia different in the Quran than what is being practiced today. So tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we are going to deal with that whole issue. Okay, thank you. As how the Quran talks of Sharia. Okay. How the word Islam is used, Deen is used, Sharia is used in the Quran. Thank you. So we'll get there, inshallah. Thank you. Um, thank you for speaking on, on the, the different Sharias uh, mentioned in Surah Maida. And the fact like the the essence and how the the different labels of the religion that you follow doesn't necessarily um, reflect your own real faith and that 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 is what what God is saying counts in there those who believe and those who, who believe in the day of judgment and the Rasul um, but I have seen in Surah Maida at the beginning, there is, and it's just, Surah Maida is one of the last, if not the last surah that was revealed. And it's really, um, it's interesting to see that these verses that say, that, that acknowledge these different faiths of the book, and that God says, okay, everybody has their own path, follow your path, right, are in this last surah that is revealed. But then also in the beginning of the surah, then how do you like rectify, in the beginning of the surah it talks about then like marriage and it talks about okay now the, the food of the people of the book is halal for you, but the, the marriage between, and then within, like right now we have laws of like, of, of like intermarriage between different religions, right? Like Muslim men can get married to Christian women and, where did that come in? Whereas, so, whereas, because Surah Maida, this whole thing is like the last surah to be revealed. And even things like jizya, like the different fates are, are very, like there's, law, there's laws that, that, that govern the interactions between them. So you do them. understand that this is the way I describe the revelation. It's divine communication within a human context. So it's divine communication within a human context. The divinity of it is in the essence. Yes? The formulation of it is within the humanness of it. Is within the humanness of human community. So now, of course, by the time of Surah Maida, you're having this situation as how should now political Islam be looking? 
what are the relations of different faiths, what is ordained, what is not. So Maida is saying you can marry, you can interact, you can eat each other's fruit, uh, food, so on and so forth, right? In fact, the last, in fact, this Surah Maida is actually opening up the Muslim community to actually wholeheartedly embrace the community of the people of the book and to work together. Even that was a starting point 1,400 years ago. And it should have flourished into a far more intimate relationship beyond that. And in fact, the Muslims did demonstrate that to some time, to some extent, after within the, I, I think, the period of Khilafah. They were very good with the uh, people of the book and other faiths and so forth. But then at some point within the early Khilafah, there were also distinctions being introduced. And then the Muslims came with this mindset of exclusivism, of being protecting their own identity and being the other. I mean, it's amazing that the Prophet said, do not force conversion. If you marry a Christian woman, let her be a Christian. Yes? If they have churches, you, you, you find this in, in articles that the Jews or the Christians would write, and they would say that these Muslims, Allah has given them the world order, uh, the dominance of the world today. They respect our prophets, they respect our saints, they give generously towards our churches. The Prophet told them, don't break any church. Honor them. It's a shame that Surah Maida was a starting point for initiating this particular trend of different faiths interacting more fully. But what the Muslims have done is they have segregated it even more so than what it was in the initial stages. It's a great shame. Yeah? So I'm just saying. Thank, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive uh, uh, view of uh, the equality of religion. Uh, however, you forgot one very important verse, and please don't take this as a criticism, please, please. just as a mean to educate me. In Surah Ali Imran, verse 19, it says, In the in the al Islam, indeed, the Truly, the religion with Allah is Islam. Now, uh, I don't know if this is contradictory to what you said or how you will reconcile that. It was the Quran revealed in one day. It took 23 years, right? In the deed in the light, Islam is coming on the fourth day from today or third day. <laughs> you can't say everything in one shot, can you? <laughs> We have caused it to, to, to descend sequentially, slowly, slowly. We'll get there. We'll get there. And you will get a beautiful explanation of that, yes? That Tabatabai and everybody says that does not mean Islam, the religion you're following. It means something very different. And we're going to start this topic tomorrow, actually, yes? The meaning of Islam in the Quran. Right. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I'll keep my question brief. Um, uh -huh. I think I was touched by the point when you mentioned uh, uh, about the belief in Allah as a unifying factor for all uh, faiths and religions, right? Um, if you can just remind me the quote that those who do not believe in Allah um, are condemned and those who believe in Allah are <laughs> united or accepted. So I, I don't quite recall. <laughs> um, what I'm um, thinking about and I'm hoping you can help uh, recalibrate some of this thought is uh, precisely this belief in Allah, okay? Because what I'm struggling with is in all religious faiths and traditions, there is no singularity, and you said that, you know, that's an assumption. Singularity and universalism is really not expected. Uh, there is variety. But when it comes to the belief of Allah, right, and this may be a whole topic separate on its own, um, I'm troubled with what I find even within the Islamic tradition, anthropomorphization of Allah, ownership of Allah, really describing Allah in terms of emotion and anger and feelings that we humans do, which is a transient existence because we're a collection of, of things that is as a result of our material being, right? Um, 
So where, where do we start? Because it, it, I'm excited to hear that it is the common belief in Allah that will unite us, but I think we're all struggling. Even those who believe in Allah have different versions. And even among the religions are different variations. Then the, those who don't believe in Allah, like you said yesterday, don't believe in a particular kind. So is there hope? No, no, no. no Nobody is supposed to believe in the same Allah. Everybody is supposed to believe in different God. Kullun ya'mal ala shakilati. Lord, all, let all act in accordance with their form. The Jannah is desirous of Salman and Abu Dhar. Yet, if Abu Dhar were to know what is within the chest of Salman, la kafarahu, Abu Dhar will say Salman is a kafir. La qattalahu will say, kill Salman. They both believe in different gods and they believe in the same God. Yes, it's the relationship that they have with their God. Anthropomorphism, Allah says, Yadullah fuqa idihim. Ainama tawallu fasama wajhullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those things in the Quran. Allah says, Ghadib Allah alayhim. Allah got angry at them. Yes? Allah yastahzi ubihim. Allah mocks at them. He attributes himself with those qualities. So obviously, if somebody then has that sort of a notion of God, then they will root it in the Quran as well. We cannot say that we should have singularity in the notion of God. In fact, the one thing that does not have any uniformity or universality is the notion of God. Yes? Everybody is worshipping a different God. Even the mosaic God, the God of Musa, is different to the God of Ibrahim. And that is why one is Khalil and the other is Kalim. There can be no singularity. We will explain this when we get into the uh, lecture of individuality uh, and relativity. So please wait, we'll get there. Yes, inshallah. I, uh, I was wondering if you could comment on pluralism uh, within Islam. There seems to be so much sectarianism and exclusion of some uh, uh, sects, like uh, Ahmadi Muslims being declared non-Muslims and stuff like that. How do we deal with that? This is a tragedy of the Muslims that have become very intolerant and that they are not examining their theology critically. Now, I discussed this last year in Australia, that definitely to be a Muslim, we need to admit to certain articles. Amongst those are only two that are fundamental, belief in the unity of God and the Risal of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Whoever believes in the Risal of Prophet Muhammad is a Muslim. Now I ask the question, in addition to believing in the Risal of Prophet Muhammad, is there a further article that asks for belief in his finality as well? Yes? So that if somebody does not believe in him as a final prophet, are they excluded from Islam? Or can you just say they are Muslims, but they are mistaken? Yes? It's, a, it's a very technical point. Belief in Prophet Muhammad as a qualifier for being a Muslim is agreed to or agreed upon by all. But is the finality of the belief in the messengership of the Prophet also a requirement? Now, if it is, then what if somebody has an interpretation that yes, he is the final messenger, but we still have, or he's the final Prophet, but we still have another Prophet that does not infringe with the notion of finality. What if somebody can come out with that sort of a notion? and justify in their own framework that we believe in the Prophet Muhammad and we believe in his finality and we believe in this person, Mr. X here as well and that does not infringe with his finality in the way we are understanding it. What if there were justification for it? Can we say that they are excluded from Islam? The answer is no. At most you can say, okay, we feel they are mistaken. But this attitude of intolerance that we have within Islam is wholly ungodly. It's not right. We started off with Ahmadis, then we go to the Ismailis, and then the Sunnis will come to the Shias. And then the Sunnis will fight each other until there will be no Muslim left. Yeah? I don't know where we are headed to. It's about time we address these issues. They're very difficult, but we need to talk about them. Yeah. If the Prophet and the Imams are perfect, does that mean they can make mistakes? And if so, then how can we be like them? 
So now I have a problem with the word perfect and, and, and things like that. Something that the Quran does not use, we have a bit of a difficulty in using those words. What I say is that they are of the prophetic substance and they are the finest of God's creatures. And their merit is due to the fact that they were able to be very God focused. But the Quran itself points at the mistake that the Prophet Muhammad made in his adjudication. And the Shia Mufassirin agree that in one instance the Muslim had stolen something and planted the evidence in, the, in a Jewish household. So the Prophet adjudicated and he obviously gave a judgment against the Jews. The Quran revealed to the Prophet that these people are trying to misguide you. And if Allah had not intervened, indeed, they would have misguided you. So the Prophet reopened the case and then put it right. <coughs> so, here, the Quran admits that the Prophet, to the best of his understanding, passed a judgment on the weight of evidence, but that judgment was a false judgment. Here is an invitation for the Muslim to open their mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Moses killing a person. He talks about Dawood doing something. He talks about Adam doing something. He talks about Suleiman doing something. So we wonder, are the Muslims reading the Quran or what are they reading? We need to work into these topics. If Allah gives life, this is something we will touch on next year. Inshallah. Yeah, if Allah gives life, that's a very big if, isn't it? That's what I thought.